Hi, this is Amy Lewis with Cisco Marketing here on today's episode of Engineers Unplugged. This is a very special episode because we're hosting a cage match around OpenStack. We've got Colin McNamara and Joe Onisik, and uh, I'm going to toss it to you, Joe, and uh, we've got the doors locked. Only one person will remain uh, victorious. Thanks, Amy. I just want to let the, the viewers know, since you can't tell, Colin is wearing a jacket, but he's ready to talk open source. He does smell like a drum circle in tears. Um, with that, Colin, can you, can, you tell me, <laughs> can you tell me why you like OpenStack? Well, OpenStack and open source in general. So right now, when you look at kind of where our market's going, you know, our customer needs are evolving. So, you know, if you look at our manufacturing partners, our software partners are very good at providing enterprise virtualization solutions, the VMware, Hyper-V, Citrix, so on and so forth. But what's evolving with like these mobile applications, right? So if I look at all the applications I use every day on my phone, my laptop, I don't even have my laptop with me. So these new mobile applications are being built for cloud platforms like Amazon. So for me personally, I believe that our customer base, and my customer specifically, and myself as a business, we have a need to have things like Amazon, but actually have them run in our own data centers. So and what we do in the OpenStack Foundation, when, what I do at Nexus in helping the foundation, sponsoring them, and also with our peers at Cisco, is contribute software to the community and help our customers adopt it to create, frankly, clones of Amazon on-premise inside of their data centers, side-by-side -side with these enterprise virtualization solutions, such as VMware, Cisco, or Citrix, and Microsoft. Makes sense, thanks. Uh, so when you've got uh, so many competing solutions out there and you've got CloudStack, which actually has customers and a product, why, uh, why would you choose OpenStack? And would you say it's as evolved and ready for uh, enterprise production workloads? So I love how positive and direct you are, Joe. You know, that you're, you're a flowery personality. I try. So, so the reality is, though, you know, OpenStack is emerging software. So if you look at, you know, classically in enterprise, enterprises or commercial customers, you go ahead and people consume open, open source technology every day. Every day we use Linux, we use Apache, we use Nginx, right? And a lot of platforms even Cisco uses in their products is open source. However, most people wait until it's provided to them and a manufacturer repackages it, rebrand it. Well, what's happening right now, there's, there's a definitely competing software packages. So if you look at CloudStack, look at OpenStack, and you look at Eucalyptus, those are just kind of our three main options for kind of cloud platforms that are differentiated versus our enterprise virtualization platforms. OpenStack itself is absolutely early on. Right, and if anyone's telling you that it's fully baked, that it's fully ready, and it's, it's totally stable in all aspects, they are lying to you. But the reality is, is what's being created is new features being added every single day that, that are adding value at a pace foul, far outpacing a cloud stack, which frankly, sorry Aaron, I know you're, you're running technical marketing there, but you know, cloud stacks really died on the vine. Right, um, Eucalyptus itself, you know, it's stable, it's been around for a while, but new features are not being added. You know, OpenStack itself, there's so many developers. You know, over, over the past uh, probably four months, we've gone from 550 to 700 active developers in the project, as well as having our, the manufacturers really pl create pl uh, products to plug in, whether it be EMC, Cisco, NetApp, even VMware with Nasira, are really contributing a lot of code. So absolutely, is it totally reproduction ready for everyone in the world to use it? No. But for certain workloads, these new mobile applications, these cloud applications, it's actually really cool. So you've got a lot of developers and a lot of people involved in the OpenStack community, and uh, with with that kind of community or uh, decision by committee basis, what I end up seeing is things like the uh, the Wikipedia discussion page for the new Star Trek movie, where you get about ten pages of people chit chatting about which way they should capitalize a letter, and that kind of sounds like what you're getting with OpenStack because you're really not production ready, but you got a lot of features and you got a lot of people playing along. No, actually, quite the opposite. That's what you get with IETF. By the way, Internet Engineering Task Force is a whole bunch of meetings and discussions, no action. Uh, the cool thing about OpenStack is code wins, right? So, you know, last year everyone's saying, hey, governance is the biggest issue. Uh, if you look at the foundation, the foundation uh, was created, um, the, the uh, governance model was established, um, there's elections, there's both board members, um, uh, three different levels inside there, as well as pro uh, product or project technical leads. It's really benevolent, uh, benevolent uh, dictatorship. And the reality of what happens is functioning code wins. It's not about a committee where everyone argues and stalls. It's let's put code together, let's roll it out, let's work in, in, in our target customers and target infrastructures, and we all have varying needs. And basically, whoever's willing to commit developers, commit code, and commit resources is able to merge in really good software. Excellent. So would I be able to uh, put OpenStack on any commodity hardware right now? Because that's kind of the vision and promise, right? So can I, can I just grab whatever I want, throw it on my data center, and start running some development? 
Well, I mean, technically you can. Now, will it function as you need it with all the cool features? Eh, your mileage may vary. Um, what we find so far is there's uh, different peoples who have different usage of OpenStack. Now, most people are building it up in test dev. So to be successful with OpenStack right now, it's not something you just download, click, and install. Right? You really have to be committing development resources or partnering with a partner or manufacturer who's doing it. Um, the largest installations out there, if you look at like Comcast, what they've been talking about, um, I think I can talk pu publicly about some large auction, uh, online auction sites and payment people who are doing some really interesting stuff. Um, but people are, are contributing code, they're, they're adding features. Because if you actually look at when people build enterprise software, right, open, so open source software, there's a cycle that gets involved, right? So people have a need, right, and they contribute developers, and this is what's called upstream. Now eventually, companies like Red Hat, companies like Canonical and Ubuntu, they pick it up and they, they repackage it into software that you can contribute and, uh, or that you can buy and install. But eventually, people like you know, Cisco and whatnot, and you know, EMC, HP, they take it and they build it into like converged systems. Well, the thing is, right now, this is where OpenStack is. It's upstream emerging software. And so people that are building cloud-centric applications that are integrating their development and their operation teams together, they're playing up here. And I think a lot of times what you talk about is people who live down here. And, th and th it's important to understand that to be successful in emerging software, not only do you have to have software development, but you have to, you have, to have a different way of operating IT. You have to cha use cha different change control. You have to have agile operations. Utilize different tools like Puppet or Chef. And partner with key manufacturers. At the end of the day, you can build them on, on, on commodity software. You can hack quantum all day long, or you, know, you can just use the Cisco plugins. Throw it on UCS, plug it in 7K and 5K, and have effectively software-defined network topologies without having to code it yourself. So would it be safe to say that today I'm going to need some significant uh, services hours and development hours in order to get OpenStack up and running for production workloads or dev workloads even? To a point. So it depends what kind of skill sets you have. Um, most people right now, you can get an install running, especially if you want to start developing on it. So one of the talks that I give at, at the Design Summit and we give out in the community is how an engineer can contribute. And there's new skills. So you can get a rather a small uh, single server, dual server pilot instance up to start connecting applications to it fairly easy. Um, to actually get an operational infrastructure though, it does take significant changes, project management, software development, and operational tools and technologies. And once I get that up and running, what would my, uh, what would my code upgrades look like when a new release comes out? <laughs> That's a giant pain in the rear right now, honestly. So uh, right now, uh, this is when I talk about which applications are a proper home for OpenStack. Those mobile applications, the applications that run well on Amazon, that expect, uh, uh, that treat a server like a process, it's the server's not permanent, run well. So you actually, you put up two side-by-side -side instances and you just migrate over. If you're doing like you'd migrate on VMware, those enterprise virtualization solutions, because remember, you know, our converged infrastructure that runs VMware, Citrix, Hyper-V, whatever, there's still a need from it. And that's what you do for server vert. But there's a whole other class of Amazon and clones of it where these kind of uh, cloud applications, you might say. They're not OpenStack. I can't even fit it right here. Right, so you're not saying that OpenStack replaces the world. OpenStack is not a replacement for VMware. OpenStack is not a replacement for Citrix. And Citrix and VMware are not a replacement for OpenStack. They're two different things, and you have to treat them differently. So one of the things that I would assume in treating them differently is I'm going to have to code my software for infrastructure failure rather than the typical enterprise environment where I'm building hardware to prevent those failures. Well, yeah, and this is, this is something where you really have to take a different operational model that to be successful in this emerging software, to effectively have your IT emulate Amazon, you have to do things like take your ops guys and, and peer them with your development teams. Advise them on, hey, I got these infrastructure features that you can code into your application. And when you take that kind of DevOps mentality uh, of making infrastructure and application as one, you're able to actually take, a, take this infrastructure and make something useful out of it. Excellent. Thanks, Colin. Oh, thank you. So great conversation. Thank you. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting is it sounds like both of you agree. I know it's shocking, but at a high level, you both agree that software defined is here to stay. Am I hearing that, that this is the wave of the future? Absolutely. I mean, the reality of today's infrastructure is, you know, infrastructure elements are, are exposed via APIs and applications, and, and our new applications are both software and a collection of the infrastructure that we join into it. And that, that is the, the current, actually, that, that, that's a, that is today, and that's our future moving forward. And would you agree with that, Jeff? I'd agree completely. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're doing it on-prem or off-prem, you need something that's going to scale quickly to your business demands, and that's going to be done through software. Okay, so on the unicorn scale, how, how close are we to this magical place? 
uh, is it zero to ten unicorns? How close are we? Are we at the software defined nirvana, like on the uh, the big wheel? I'd say a solid. Point. I think it really depends which applications. So absolutely, I use applications every day that are full unicorn compliant. But then every day I still use unicorn, you know, applications in my enterprise virtualization. I only have one and a half unicorns. So we need to put the glitter in. Get some more unicorns. What do you think, Joe? Agreed. I think you take companies like Netflix, and I think they're all unicorns. And you take other companies, and they're, they're they're starting to get there. And we definitely have tons of enterprises and federal government agencies that are zero unicorn. Actually, federal government has uh, some pretty significant OpenStack going on right now. Oh boy, I might have a little unicorn. I might have. I'm ducking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, viewers of Engineers Unplugged. We have declared this uh, season two for, of Engineers Unplugged the Year of the Unicorn, and now you see why. So thank you, Colin. Thank you, Joe. Great episode. Um, no blood was shed, but I'm going to cut the camera before that happens. So see you next week on Engineers Unplugged. Mm -hmm.